case of the New York Three. Originally, it was New York Five. Okay. Uh, originally, it was uh, two uh, Boricua and brothers, Francisco Torres and Gabriel Torres. All right. Francisco, remember I told you I first met with, with Noah and his brother Gabriel Torres, who was also part of the New York Five. Uh, May 21st, 19, May 19th, 1971, uh, two um, police officers were wounded, okay? Uh, May 21st, 1971, two police officers were killed, uh, all right? What state? In New York. New York police officers, New York, okay, were killed. Um, Daruba bin Wahab in June was captured uh, for the May 19th event, okay? And come to find out 19 years later that he did not commit that, okay? August 28th, 1971, Noah and myself was captured in San Francisco and subsequently charged with the New York May 21st killing. <clears throat> All right. And it was due to our having possession of a weapon they, they claimed was, uh, actually, we had possession of two weapons, right? One they said what came from one of the officers, the other one they said claimed to have been my weapon and was, was one of the murder weapons. All right. May 21st, 1970, 1971. May 26th, 1971. J. Edgar Hoover, Richard Nixon, John Ehrlichman, and um, several members of the Watergate Plumbers break-in crew had a meeting in the White House on this particular case. And the meeting they had in the White House was to determine who was responsible for the May 19th and May 21st incident. And they then determined um, that they were going to find uh, BLA or BPP members for this event, for these, these incidents, all right? And they came up with the acronym or a code name for this investigation that Richard Nixon told J. Edgar Hoover to deal with, right? And it was called New Kill, right? New Kill meanings, New York killings, all right? <clears throat> so, um, the first trial was two trials. The first trial ended in a hung jury for the New York Five. All right. Um, the second trial, from which, uh, when the jurors were to receive the case to deliberate, it was a decision made uh, by the, the defense the prosecutor and the judge to dismiss the charges for Francisco and Gabriel Torres, saying they didn't have the evidence to take the trial, or take to the jurors, let the jurors deliberate on. <clears throat> um, and so soon thereafter, uh, Noah, myself, and Herman were convicted. Approximately a year to two years later, VA Freedom of Information Act, we obtained documents. For instance, let me go back just, just a bit and just say, during the course of the trial, we argued vehemently, you know, our innocence, right, that we were not the ones who had dealt, dealt this, did this, this action, and uh, but the, the case that they brought against us, they had, for instance, two witnesses were bought. No if and buts about it, they were bought. Um, they were given money, uh, they were given house to live in, transportation, spending money, the whole bit, all right? In fact, one of the women who testified against us escaped left the DA's um, security witness, witness house protection, 
right? Left, right? Escaped. And then was recaptured. Okay, because she didn't want to testify. And they told her, listen, you're going to testify, we're going to take your children away from you. All right? Um, <clears throat> so she relented uh, to give this, this, this testimony. Um, we fun to find out years later that she had an arrest for weapons and possession of marijuana. And part of the deal for her to testify against us was that these cases would be dropped. However, when she was to testify and asked did she have any pending cases, she said she did not. All right? That there was no deals made between herself and the DA for her testimony. The DA had an obligation to correct her testimony for perjury. He failed to do so. That's one. Two, another witness, the guy who was a Black Panther Party member and who at the time was a gun runner. And what I mean by gun runner, I mean he used to, he used to run guns from one coast to the next coast. All right, you know, uh, if a weapon was hot, he will move it to the other coast or so forth, whatever. You know, he's, that was his job, all right? He got arrested in um, Louisiana, I think it was 1974. And um, they tortured him. And of course, we had him to testify in this case. And what I mean by torture, I mean exactly that. They used cattle prods on his testicles, they put needles on his testicles, they beat him for five days straight, they put him in a cell with a, a, a schizophrenic, uh, left lights on uh, 24 hours a day, um, so he can get no rest, no sleep. Um, and each day they'd bring him out, they cattle prod him, needles to his testicles, and whoop his behind, all right, until the point in time where he was willing to say anything and everything they want him to say. Again, like the first woman I mentioned who had escaped, didn't want to testify, he asked to be brought before the judge prior to his testimony, okay? He came before the judge prior to his testimony, and he came before the judge and he told the judge, listen, what I'm getting ready to testify to is not the truth. Not the truth, right? Then I'm going to be purging myself if I testify. The judge contacted the DA's office and told the DA, listen, you better talk to your witness before he takes the stand. The judge had an obligation to tell the defense attorneys that about this judge, about this witness, the judge did not do so. The district attorney got the witness, told the witness, if you testify the way I want you to testify, I'm gonna put you back in the hands of these officers who tortured you. How'd you find this out? We found this out through Freedom of Information Act and also through an affidavit, for instance, that one particular witness, he made an affidavit. After his testimony, he made an affidavit stating the fact that his testimony was perjury. He also got on a uh, ABC, uh, um, ABC uh, TV program called Like It Is um, and publicly stated that his testimony was false. All right. Not only that, let me continue. The weapon that they said was my weapon that I was supposed to have used to have killed these officers, the FBI did ballistics test on the weapon and determined that it was inconclusive as this had been the actual weapon used in this case. The DA had that ballistics test uh, uh, record, all right, and failed to turn it over to the defense. When New York City Police Department ballistics expert got on the stand, he stated that he did all the tests, no one else did any tests, all right, and that it was in fact a murder weapon. That's what he stated, okay? We received, through Freedom of Information Act, new kill documents that indicated, the FBI documents that stated, in fact, that the FBI had did ballistics. Not only did the FBI do ballistics, the FBI did ballistics on the ballistics materials 
that the New York City Police Department said that he did his tests on. In other words, he didn't do any tests on the ballistic materials. The FBI didn't test on the ballistic materials. They found out that the weapon was the inconclusive, has not been the murder weapon, all right? And all this information was withheld at the time of trial. We received over 10,000 pages of Freedom of Information Act documents um, coming from uh, this new kill uh, FBI uh, um, Nixon, Richard Nixon uh, investigation of this case, over 10,000 pages. I shifted through, went through each one of those pages looking for what was going on with this case. I right, tried to find some kind of way to, to deal with this matter. <clears throat> um, so I came up with the information dealing with the ballistics. And in, um, matter of fact, I was in this facility at that time. So in, in 1981, I filed a petition uh, for a new trial based upon these documents. Uh, I think it was in October of 1981. <clears throat> and after the petition was filed, approximately four months later, <laughs> someone went into the ballistics evidence locker, took out the weapon, took out all the bullets, we got all the test results and destroyed them, and destroyed them. To this very day, we don't know who ordered for that to be done, all right? So what I'm saying is that they prevented us to having the weapon to be retested so we can prove that the weapon was not the murder weapon. <clears throat> Can't they say now that there's no weapon? Exactly. To say that it was the murder weapon? No. Okay. Now that we've been convicted of this, they can't, we, we cannot, it's not a question of, now we have to prove our innocence. Right. Therefore, we don't have the evidence to prove our, ev uh, our innocence, we can't prove our innocence. They don't have to prove guilt anymore. No, they don't have to prove guilt anymore. Okay? So now the, the burden is on us. They got their conviction. All right? So um, what that indicates, for the most part, there has been a giant cover-up, a giant cover-up of this case throughout the entire, from the beginning to the end. They just wanted to bust somebody. Daruba was lucky that he was able to exonerate, get himself exonerated for May 19th, okay? Some cover-ups are better than, than others, all right? And in this instance, they did a hell of a job. You know, there's three, there's, there, there has been three, three um, stories told about this case. And each one of those stories told about this case is a different story, right? There's uh, uh, Target Blue, tells one story. Chief, tells a different story. Badger Assassin, tells a third story. Three different stories about what happened, this, the dynamics of this case, you know. What was, what was the rationale from dropping it from New York 5 to New York 3? The uh, they, they claimed that they didn't have enough evidence for Francisco and Gabriel Torres. So they had to dismiss, dismiss them. The evidence that they said that they had for, for me was they said that I was arrested with the, the murder weapon. Come to find out, and I tried to tell us at, at time of trial, that's not the murder weapon. That's not the gun. You know? But I couldn't prove it. You know? So when, now when the FBI does ballistics tests, and they say, that's not the murder weapon, but the prosecutor, the DA, withhold that evidence, the judge knowing the evidence being withheld, all right, and we cannot prove, you know what I'm saying, that this is not the murder weapon, what choice do we have? No. And then when we do have the information to prove that it's not the murder weapon, the murder weapon, the ballistics materials, and everything associated with it disappears. It's gone. Now, what did I tell you? If that don't tell you some, uh, 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 that there's a cover-up, what does? You know, major cover-up. You know, and the cover-up comes from the White House on down. Why? Because they didn't want. We have documents that the FBI makes inquiries. J. Edgar Hoover makes inquiries to New York FBI office asking, does any of the materials being given over to the defense 
for to indicate that it came from the FBI. The attorney general, I mean the district attorney, informs the FBI none of the materials that have been handed over to the defense can be identified as ever coming from the FBI. All right? So that shows you right there that the district attorney participated, was an active participant in the cover-up. That the FBI was concerned about whether or not we find out to what extent the FBI was involved in this case and how far it leads up the chain of command, all the way to the White House. My argument today is that Nixon recorded every conversation that happened in the White House. We know that. It's, it's been stated, history, historically been established that he recorded everything that went on in the White House. And I'm saying that May 26, there are tapes on this particular case. There are White House tapes on this particular case in regards to what happened or how they came up with the idea of new kill and the whole bit. Now, I've had individuals, lawyers, go over to the National Archives and try to obtain records for May 26 on this particular case. They've <clears throat> found various documentations about what happened prior to May 26 and after May 26. And then when they go to the a woman by the name of uh, Nikichi Taifa, right, who was, uh, uh, works for uh, uh, Howard Law, right? she's a, a professor at Howard. Um, she tells me that when she made inquiries as to the May 26 documents, the guy who was the head of the library, director of the library, told her, oh, you mean the, the case about the two New York killings, or police killings? She said, yeah, 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 that, yeah, that's the case. She says, no, we don't have those documents. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. He knows the case off the top of his head, but they say they don't have the records. They don't have the, the tapes. I know damn well that, that, uh, that uh, Richard Nixon got those tapes. The tapes are somewhere. They recorded, or they destroyed them, one or the other. Like they destroyed everything else. That can't be the only day they talked about it either. Huh? That cannot be the only day that they talked about it. I bet you there are no, other okay. tapes. There are other Should've. tapes out there to be had. We searched for them. We can't find the tapes. We can't find Nixon's tapes on this case. But we know they exist. There's been a massive cover-up on this case. They know, they, know that I, they know that weapon was not the murder weapon. They know that I did not do this. They know that. Just like they knew that the Ruben did not do that. They know that. That's why there was three different stories that have been told about this, this case. When you say stories, you mean books? Books. Yeah. Three different stories. You say specifically what the directive was in the, from the White House to... This, this is, these are communiques. These, these are, these are communiques, uh, uh, letters between John Ehrlichman, J. Edgar Hoover. So it said target anybody who's a member that you know of as a member of the Black Liberation mm -hmm. Army. Uh, that is the belief, because this is who they went after. Let me, let me, give, you, let me give you another scenario. The FBI's investigation in this case, <laughs> check this out. The officers in this case was a black officer and a white officer, all right? In the colonial housing projects, the polo grounds. Now, there are, there is also two housing police officers that works in the Colonial Housing Project Polo Grounds, one black, one white. They were involved in drug dealings in the housing colonial projects. There are FBI documents that states a drug dealer said that he's going to hit these guys. Okay? FBI documents that says through the investigation, they determined that a drug dealer said they was going to hit these two housing police officers, and they believed that it was a mistake made, and these two cops got hit instead of two housing officers. All right? There was a drug dealer who, who, who bragged, yeah, we got those guys. Yeah, FBI documents that says that. Okay? They go after them. They didn't go after them say it was a mistake. They didn't go after them. You see? So 
That's a cover-up. They know what happened with this case. They know what happened. But they want to get us off the streets. Why? Because Jerry Hoover says that the Black Panther Party is the national security, was the uh, greatest national security threat of the United States. See? That's the situation that we're confronting here. You know, that's the reality of this case, man. Straight up. And I have documents to prove it. The documents is there, straight up. And you know, it's just, you know, but it's gonna take it's gonna take a a, a, a movement, it's gonna take a political movement, you know, just like it did for Geronimo to get out when they knew damn well he was not dealing with that Olsen murder, that he was 500 miles away in uh, uh, in Oakland when the thing went down in Santa Monica and Los Angeles, and they knew it, but he did 27 years in prison behind it. They knew uh, Daruba was not involved in that. He did 19 years in prison, you know, behind that situation, and here I am. Okay, that's the reality of the situation. Noah got a death sentence. That's what Noah received. You know, he died of liver cancer, but he died. Of, it was a death sentence. He, there's nothing, no evidence whatsoever regarding his case, regarding him being part of this case. Nothing. Not no eyewitnesses, no physical evidence, no nothing. The exception, of course, he was arrested with me in California. That's it. What? How did Herman get arrested? Herman was arrested in, in Louisiana in um, 74. And they tied him up to this case. And they tied him to this case. They said you guys were all together. They said we were all together. Yeah. They were picking us up all over the country, stringing us along. Hmm. That's what it was about. Now. You know, what can I say? You know, when when a judge sentences us, you know, he says that if these men are prisoners of war, then they have to recognize they're being captured by the enemy, and they expect what they're going to expect. That's the judge sentencing statement. Yeah, he essentially said that we're prisoners of war. Judge sentencing statement. That we actually live a plutocracy. The rich rules the rich controls the mechanisms of government. They influence it, they bought it, they control it. You know? And then any time, you know, so we have the, the hypocrisy of democracy and not an actual democracy, okay? Actually, we have is a plutocracy. But it's guised under, you know, it's hidden behind the veneer of a democracy, you know? So we can see the, the Oz, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the old wizard, the Oz in the background, Shifting the levers, because the, the, shifting the, the scenery, you know, and making everything appears to be uh, um, democratically uh, evolved. But the, the reality of the situation is that the, the system is, is, is manipulated. It's manipulated terribly by money interests, okay? And the majority of the public suffers, you know. And because there's no serious cultural dynamic that challenges how the system operates, you know, uh, in America, um, there's no way to gauge how one is being manipulated. Because the media, uh, uh, all forms of media, is part of keeping people deluded and believing that what is real <laughs> is, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 the idea of what is real is real, you know? And so we, we look at the, 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 uh, uh, the media and what is being taught us through the various forms of media, and we think that is the reality, but in truth it is the Oz, it is the wizard in the background. And um, we have to try to um, break that uh, delusionment. Uh, we have to try to break that the illusion, you know, that this uh, the system is actually working for the ultimate benefit of the people, you know, for the people, by the people, you know, the whole idea of what is supposed to exist, you know, we have to break that delusionment, you know, and uh, and I think that although people are beginning to see 
uh, the, the money interests behind the politics and how the politics is being manipulated. Uh, you know, for instance, like they show uh, the last couple of conventions they and, and, and the conventions going on now, they show these big parties of uh, where the money interest goes and, and talk to the politicians and so forth and so, so on, the corporations go, but they refuse to let the media in. You know, the media is barred. You say, this is a private party. You can't come in here. You can go to the convention and watch the show. <laughs> you can take the show. You see what I'm saying? So now that tells you right there, wait a minute, there's two things going on here. There's the money interest, the real power, and then there's the show, where the politicians get up there and smile in your face. And so the media is concentrated on the show, right, and not on the true money interest, you know. So <clears throat> what we have to try to get people to look, recognize and say, hey, listen, that's the show. You know, the real power behind this show, the ones who are really manipulating what's going on with this show, this movie that we're watching here called Life, right, is these power interests over here, you see? And so we need to concentrate on how they are manipulating the system. And if we can begin to let people start seeing that, I think it's possible for us to have a foreign press people's convention where we began to draw up our own national agenda and the manner upon which we can challenge the system in a coherent, in a coherent way that really, really affects uh, the way people live in this country, you know? Uh, and I mean, and, and more so the, you know, the workers, you know, the workers are, are you know, they've been, been so manipulated now, man, the only thing they want to do is just get a job, make the money, spend the money, give money back to the corporations so they can go back to work, get some more money, spend the money back to the corporations, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 and live this materialistic uh, existence. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is the, is the level of um, institutional racism that has become a, um, a real serious problem you know, in this country. You know, and, and, it's, and it's hard for me to, to you know, as, as I walk into prison yards, you know, uh, and look at the sea of faces, and all the things I see, the majority of what I see is black and brown faces. The majority of what I see is black and brown faces. I have to question what the hell is going on, okay? You have to question to the extent of this. If there are 250 million people in this country, and black and brown people that at most comprise no more than 50 million, right? However, we comprise 58 to 80 percent of the prison population. Are you telling me that only black and brown people are committing crime in this country? And if so, right, although I don't believe that's true, but if and if it is true, then we have to ask another question, why? There's something wrong with the unequal distribution of wealth then. So now we have either one or two problems, or probably both. Unequal distribution of wealth, that poor people has to commit crime, that poverty is the impetus towards crime, right? So we're not addressing the issues of poverty, one. Or two, institutional racism has created a, a dynamic or mechanism to put poor or black people, people of color, in prison. Now, is it one or the other or the combination of both? I think it's a combination of both, okay? And it's a very simple formula. You know, when you dress it and you look at it, it's very simple. It's, that's the issue, okay? And I think that it has to be dressed in very simplistic form, just that way, you know, uh, uh, right in people's face. You know, that we are dealing with the questions of institutional racism and unequal distribution of wealth, all right? And it's done in such a way that they have found a new way to make money, a new way to make money of poor, black and brown people, right? So they take away the steel mills, take away the major industries, and then they create prisons, okay? And it has become so, <clears throat> it has become so um, formulated, 
the way that it's going on, become so formulated that now the bodies have become commodities in the system. Okay? So now my number, 778-4283, you can basically say that's a barcode. You know what I mean? And that cell is like, you know, they trying to figure out, well, how much uh, shelf life I have for this particular product, this particular commodity in this particular cell, so how much money I can make from this individual. All right? So now we're counting heads as if there are uh, cans on a shelf, you know, in this industry, this prison industrial complex, to the point whereby now these counties, the outland, out uh, areas, uh, sub rural areas, they are now getting taxes for the number of individuals in their county. And they're counting prisons as part of the tax roll. The prison is part of the tax roll. You know, so it's not so much as now that we're getting jobs, but are getting tax breaks and, you know, the, the whole. So now, naturally, you know, these counties want a prison. And then, so if you have a industry that feeds off people's lives, you have to figure out some kind of way to make sure that the industry continues to expand and grow. And how do they do that? They change the laws to make the laws much more repressive so that more people go to prisons for less violations of the law and stay in prison for longer periods of time. They say by the year 2000 that $7.9 billion will be made off of prison labor. Yes. We know the prison labor is expanding exponentially. Yes. At the same time, there seems to be an enormous increase in control units, isolation of prisoners. Sure. Now, prisoners who are isolated in control units are not working. They're not providing prison labor for the capitalists. So it seems to me they're, they're, they're providing jobs. To, to create control units, you have to create a new uh, um, uh, form of cr building those kind of units. So they're architectural jobs. Yeah, right. But once the once those job once those prisons are built, yeah. there's so much less movement that you need many less guards. They they prefer it that way. Why? Why? Well, I'm asking you what. Well, it's it's it's, it's cause, because because. They feel that the individuals they put in these control units are the, the more incorrigible prisoner. So in order to maintain some level of stability in the prison population, particularly where they have certain industries, like for here, like this institution here, they make license plates. You know, they make license plates all over the state, I think all over the uh, western, uh, the eastern uh, uh, seaboard, right? Um, so there's a big money-making institution here. Right? And so in order to maintain some levels of, of stability and right, control, they have to create institutions to put the, the more, more incorrigible prisoner. Right? And uh, so when you have that kind of uh, leverage right, or threat over the head of prisoners, you know, that we will lock you away, put you in a cell 24-7, and uh, you know, feed you what we want to feed you and treat you how we want to treat you, you know, you know, that it kind of lessens the, the 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 degree of resistance, you know, to what goes on in the prison system. So, and, and you know, and, and understanding how prison operates, you, you can see where they may have a need, particularly when you have so many more people coming into the system. You know, so it's a mechanism of control. So, who are these incorrigibles? What who are they? they? Yeah, what do they consider? What do prisons feel threatened by, and who do they consider to be? Incredible? For the most part, for, for you know, uh, from my own experience, right, the majority of the individuals they have in these control units are young, uh, um, uh, illiterate um, people, you know, young young men, illiterate, who are just rebellious, you know, is not giving in to to authority and the mechanism from which the prison operations. Um, and then you also have uh, those who are mentally uh, uh, unstable, you know, where they put in these in these in these areas because they cannot function in in the, in the prison environment, you know. Um, 
And so they find it, they find their way into these kind of uh, environments, the control units. Unfortunately, the control units does not benefit them at all. You know, and, and, and more more often than not, it exacerbate, exacerbate the situation. It makes it worse for them. You know, because they don't get the kind of mental uh, um, uh, treatment. You know that they, they really need. You know, and I, I I was upstairs in this institution. I had a guy banging on the wall, driving me and ugh, batty. You know, um, he was unstable. He cannot live in, in, in an environment. You know, in, in pop, general population. You know, uh, uh, he, he 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 craves to be locked up and he get that kind of attention and the whole situation that goes on with being uh, in, in a control unit. The man is mentally unstable, all right? But he's not getting the kind of assistance, the kind of help that he really, really needs. Uh, and it's unfortunate, you know, and, well, that's, unfortunately, that's the way the system works, man. You know, have you been in a control unit? I've been in, I've been in several special housing units, you know, over the last uh, 29 years. Um, the last was, uh, was upstairs here in, in, in the box for 90 days for something that I did not do, you know. Um, let me just, you want me to share that? Yes, and I'd like you to share the experience of being in, a, in a, the shoe and okay. explain what All the right. shoe is. What happened was that uh, last year um, there was supposed to have been a statewide strike, okay, uh, dealing with the questions of the pro board and they are uh, hitting people two years, although you may go to pro board with all the requirements, everything uh, um, fulfilled in terms of ex expecting uh, to be released, they'll hit you for two years. So there's supposed to be a statewide strike. Now, <clears throat> um, I have a history. I'm not going to deny that. I have a history of, of organizing in prison, okay? Um, however, on this particular instance, uh, due to what happened in the last time, which was in Attica, right? In this instance, I was not involved in organizing, okay? Um, I was not trusting of the, the prison population here uh, because uh, we got a, a serious problem with drugs in this prison population. And these guys did, did not appear or have uh, a desire to, to stand up, to be about doing the right thing. So I didn't feel like it was necessary for me to lend myself to something that had the futility or the greater possibility of a failure. Nonetheless, the uh, administration felt that I was a threat in the prison population, and they decided to conjure a, an inf can we say a confidential informant, said that I was organizing prisoners for, for the strike. All right. But well, they took me to the box, and I was able to refute the allegations of this claimed confidential informant, all right, stating the fact that I was not organizing anyone. All right? In fact, I was telling prisoners that they don't have to decide for themselves what they're going to do, and whatever you decide to do, naturally, me being a prisoner, I'm going to go along with it. Okay, I'm not going to buck, you know, the prison population decide what they want to do. But me personally, I'm not organizing you guys. Okay, because you guys are not right. You're not ready for this. All right? So I get to the box, and the officer up there searched my personal and legal materials, looking for evidence that will support the allegations that I was organizing a strike. Not able to find anything to support that, they found some other materials that I had since 1996 in another facility and determined that that material was contraband. And therefore, they held me in the box for 90 days for um, illegal contraband. Now, I'm in the box. They have me in a cell that um, Two-thirds of the, of the front of the cell was covered with plexiglass, okay? And the whole, you know, in other words, the only area of the cell that was not, that was not covered with plexiglass was the door, 
that slides open and close. Everything else was covered in plexiglass. Um, the guy next to me on this side, or the, the, the cell next to me, was a, uh, what we call in, in prison vernacular, a bug out. Right? He was a bug out. And he would make noise all times of the day, you know, screaming and hollering, banging on the wall, uh, calling people different names, and you know, so forth and so on. And um, so I had to endure that for several couple of months while I was up there, to a point in time where he had made a decision that he's going to what he called, "I'm going to bang you out." In other words, he's going to bang on the wall until it moved me. And um, the officers uh, up there saw what was going on, and so they finally moved me uh, the last month that I had to do up in the box. They moved me to a different area, different location of the box where the cell was open cells and they had the plexiglass on it. And uh, so I did the last, the last three, three and a half weeks in an open cell. Um, they feed you in the cell through a slot. And they send you a tray and through the slot. They, um, you have one hour recreation uh, upstairs in, in the roof, uh, which is just in the, uh, an area, I guess it's about 30 feet by, by 20, or maybe about 40 feet by 20, okay, area where you walk around in, no, no, no uh, exercise equipment there at all. So you got an hour of that, and then all the rest of the time you spend in the cell. And uh, so what I did, you know, I did my studying, my legal work, you know, trying to fight these charges, it's still pending in the courts. Because I want this, I want this reversed. I don't want this on my record. You know, it shouldn't be on my record in the first place. And you know, I, I have been able to maintain a clean disciplinary record prior to coming here uh, for three years. Uh, so this is the first disciplinary uh, charge I've had in nearly five years. Okay, uh, which is a bogus charge. And uh, for, for, so. Um, they give out water twice a day. You know, they give you a little bucket of water twice a day, hot water twice a day. They pour, pour it in a bucket of water if you don't lose those privileges, because everything up there is a privilege. Even food is a privilege in the, in the box. If you are, what do you call, acting up, they'll take uh, the three meals a day from you and they'll give you a, a loaf, or what do you call a nutritional loaf as punishment. You know, which is a, what is it? it's a cabbage loaf, like a bread type thing, and you get that in water. Uh, so those are the kind of things that guys up there have to confront. Are there any differences in visitation and telephone use? No telephone use at all. Uh, visitation here is um, once a week. You get visitation once a week, and uh, it's, it's a, they got a, an area up, upstairs in in the box where they visit, where you have your visit at once a week. So if your relatives are in New York City and you're over here six hours away in Auburn, most prisoners probably rely on the telephone to communicate with their families. In the general population. But in the hall, in the box, they're There's not allowed no to. None. So they're really isolated. Isolated. The only, the only thing they can communicate with is, is by, by either by letters, right? and then you have to have money to buy stamps. Otherwise, you don't send out any letters. Okay. But well, then you know they have they have also other um, other uh, <clears throat> facilities, control unit facilities. Got double bunk facilities. You know where they have control units. Where you got two guys in the cell, and they have the shower in the cell, and they have the exercise yard right behind the cell. So as the door opens and you open up into a cage, right behind the cell, right. And so 24/7, two guys in the cell. They don't leave that. They don't leave that area for no reason other than visits and possibly for medical. That's it. And uh, we, we, there are people in those uh, institutions, those control units, uh, who've been in there f for months and for years. And some of those individuals, they have serious mental problems. Serious mental problems. And so far there has been, as far as I know, there's been one or two deaths in these units due to prisoners, uh, uh, one prisoner killing the other uh, in, in, that, in that environment, in that cell environment. Many, 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 many fights. 
many, many, many fights. When the guys don't get along, they're supposed to change it from sales, you know, different sales and so forth. But been many, many, many fights, you know, from guys don't get along. Um, but it's an experience, and, and the problem with that is that it's an experience that often these prisoners take back to the community when they get released. So there's no rehabilitation, there's no levels of education, no officer education, there's, there's no uh, uh, um, employment skills being offered, there's no therapeutic skills or therapeutic uh, uh, um, uh, help assistance being, being offered, there's no very little mental you know, other than dispensing of, uh, how you call it, psychotropic uh, medication, right? Other than that. And so, and then when the guy's parole ready, they release him back to the population, reach to the general population, uh, general uh, uh, citizen population. And so then you have situations where you have like that, that Wendy's tragedy, uh, you know, where guys get out on parole and they, they commit these heinous crimes. You know, I, matter of fact, on that particular, I wrote an article on that and sent it to, uh, it was posted in uh, Syracuse Post Standard, you know, dealing with the question of what happened at Wendy's tragedy. And it was definitely that, a tragedy. Those guys who were released, you know, somewhere, someone missed the boat. And it wasn't the pro board. You know, something happened before they even got to the pro board that someone missed the boat and dealing with these individuals. You know, so when you don't have the kind of, uh, um, of, uh, rehabilitation programs, therapeutic programs, uh, um, life skills programs, uh, preparation for release, you know, you're going to have the kind of revolving door, recidivism rate um, that goes on. Uh, and then actually, it, it doesn't affect the rural areas, because most of the prisons is down in New York City. Eighty percent of prison population come out of New York City. So there's no real threat to the rural areas so they have no problems with sending them back into their own communities so they can be commit new crimes and then therefore give them more time and send them back up here and preserve the job for these people up here in the rural areas so you know it's and it, you know it's, it's it doesn't take a, a scholar to see the destruction that is already built into the institution you know, uh, uh, of the system, uh, the prison of, system. What kind of effects do you know about personally or have you heard of, of being in isolation for an extended period of time? What starts happening? Oh, to I've had my own experience. You know, um, I was, I think I was, what was it, Elmira. Sensory deprivation is serious sensory deprivation, whereas um, you cannot see anyone and it's very difficult or you cannot speak with anyone. And sensory deprivation has several um, effects. One is claustrophobia. Um, you feel everything's closed in on you, right? Uh, the sense of loneliness, uh, being isolated, uh, creates a, a a, it can go two ways. One, you don't want to be around anybody anymore, become antisocial, right? Uh, and, and paranoid, paranoia. Or um, the other situation is that you uh, essentially become schizophrenic. You began to create imaginary people in your mind that you communicate with in order to, that you think you can maintain your, your, your sanity. But in essence, you're becoming uh, more insane. Sensory deprivation, serious problem. You know, and um, remember I talked about the Islam and prayer, right? Maintain some kind of balance, some kind of spiritual strength. When you find yourself in that kind of situation, you have to really go inside yourself and try to find some wholeness uh, to maintain some sanity. Uh, and I was grateful, you know, to have periodic visits, you know, so that I could have some human touch, you know, to have, be able to communicate uh, with, with, with people from time to time, you know, that helped me to relieve some of that, uh, that anxiety. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you have anxiety, you have anxiety, uh, uh, panic uh, 
uh, disorders. You have all those kinds of problems that comes with sensory deprivation. So you can see something of that in terms of these two men bunks, individual, individual cells, you know, where you got guys locked in 24-7. You know, there's no release, no way to uh, exercise the mind, you know, in a way that, you know, that, that comforts the spirit. <laughs> you know, it comforts the, um, the person so that he says that he's part of something greater than himself, that he's living, you know. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's destructive. It's destructive. Yeah. Well, but they, they, don't, they don't see it. The system... You know, although they recognize it, there's been t tombs of books, you know, written on the subject matter, you know, but then they continue to create that environment. Wait a minute, there's something wrong. You know. It's like the first prison that was built by the Quakers was a long-term isolation unit. The Auburn Correctional Facility. Yeah. Excuse me? This one right here. It's one of the oldest prisons in the, in the country. And didn't they shut it down? There was this one prison that they built in the, I can't remember when it was, and they were using long-term isolation and they found that their prisoners were going insane. Well, uh, it's Merriam. I think Merriam was one of the problems. Uh, um, and then, yeah, Merriam was one of them, and they, they uh, uh, shut it down for, for a period of time and, and, and sent prisoners to different areas because of that kind of a problem. Yeah, I believe Merriam was one of them. But yeah. You know, so they, 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 they know the kind of problems that it creates, and, but they, have not have the, they don't have the courage uh, to change it, you know, you know, and they feel that it works. But then naturally, you know, when you look at the situation from, from what it, how it evolves, you know, in terms of prisons coming from out of chattel slavery, you know, the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, you know, when you look at that, then, and then the people of color, you know, who was it actually built for and, and why, then you understand, you know, it's part of the history of this country, you know, and there's no way of getting around. You know, we tried to delude ourselves and said that, it, you know, that, you know, everything is peaches and cream and hunky-dory and a whole bit, but it isn't. Not for everybody. It's not. You know, especially not for people of color, not for poor people. You know, so that's the reality. So I just want to follow up with one last question, kind of getting it's back to where I was before, about 15 minutes ago, is so you do not see, it's kind of a weird way to ask a question, but I'm assuming you do not see the, you do not see it as a contradiction. It's not a contradiction to you, the growing prison labor industry and isolating control units. Do you think that they can both continue to grow at such a fast rate, or do you think one is gonna start outweighing the other? prison labor versus isolation, non-working? For as long as they can make money off prisoners, prison labor will continue. For as long as they can, as long as they can continue to build prison for prison labor, there will always be individuals who will be incorrigible and that they have to isolate. And they will put in these control units. So yeah, they go hand in hand. You know, you cannot have one, they cannot have one without the other, you know, unless they change the system. And that they can do, you know what I mean? Let me tell you, early, you know, particularly after, after in, in New York State, after the, the Attica Rebellion, all right, uh, the system had, had changed to the extent whereas a person who had come to prison was able to program. He gave all the essential necessary programs was in place. There was the therapeutic programs, the mental health programs, there were the, the various uh, uh, um, programs for alcohol abuse and narcotics abuse, and, and they were ran very well, okay? Um, you had the programs for various education, you know, all the way up to college, master's degree you could earn while in prison, and so forth, all right? So in, in that period of time, a guy could come in prison, illiterate, right? Earn a GED and come out of prison with a master's degree and then re-enter society and become an asset rather than a continued liability to his community. They stripped all of that. Because now they say, well, you're here, it's punitive, it's punishment, and we'll make a profit. 
So now it's profit driven, prison is profit driven, okay, and by being profit driven, that's the only thing that they see. So naturally, if anything is profit driven in terms of industry, you will make cutbacks on anything and anything else that would be helpful for your worker. You see what I'm saying? So you cut back on these other programs so that you can make better and more profit off your, your labor, all right? So I mean, that's in any in, in industry in terms of capitalist <laughs> social order, so, uh, capitalist society, you know what I'm saying? In order for the corporations to make more money, they will make cutbacks in terms of what is not essential for profit. And so that's what we have found here, and they justify it by, uh, by telling the, the taxpayers that they're saving the taxpayers money and so forth and so on. Uh, but that's not necessarily true because in, in the end result is that the, the end product that you're sending back to the streets is worse than the product that came in in the first part, first point, you see? Because now you make it very bitter and very angry and continue to be illiterate individual. All you need doing is taking an illiterate person and making them a bitter illiterate person and sending them back to the streets. That's a serious problem, you know. And uh, so um, I think the control units will continue and I think the, the prison industrial complex will continue to grow and uh, the private prisons will continue to grow and they'll continue to find ways to, to make money, make, make money off uh, this commodity. Uh, that they call prisoner.